Welcome back as we continue the series here. And I tell you what, these two teams that are still searching for their very first win uh, are keeping us on our feet. There is no way to understand what's going to happen because at one stage you're up by 5,000 gold, you might still lose a team fight. It's absolutely crazy. But the way they closed out that game, uh, Max, honestly, maybe one of my top five favorite endings of all time. Seriously, one of the highlights, at least for this split of the LCO, without a doubt, right? I think that the way that they not only were able to kind of pursue in the face of that Baron, you think, yeah, okay, they're just going to cut it off, they're going to accept the fact that they've lost. No, they don't give up. And that was kind of the whole story of this game, right? Fight after fight, these teams are looking for opportunities constantly. No one is just rolling over and dying, and that is what you love to see from two teams who, frankly, they can't afford to roll over and die for their season either. No, they certainly can't. And from the the interview state of things, where Refury is telling us, look, I've got an issue with my PC, we're still looking to cook. They certainly did in that game, right? We mentioned it on the cast. That was the only game of Zillion ever played uh, in season 14. No bans, nothing. And he just made it look so clean because it was basically the game winning play, right? So I'm so curious to see. Uh, now that the sides will be flipped around, they'll be on the red side if they've got any sort of special counter picks to continue that kind of trajectory. Uh, and if they are going to go for that perfect 2-0, because as we saw at the start of the day, only nine points that Mammoth can get. They literally need every single win, and they can only settle for a draw now. Only can settle for a draw now, and we'll see what their approach will be to try to secure that draw now in game two. You can already see the Jacks being taken off the board, so respecting a counter pick that Wudon brought out Earlier in the split, found a lot of success versus TN on solo killing him three times, I believe, against that Vladimir. So, very potent counter pick that he has available. And now, what do you go towards for your first pick? We saw Ash being paired so well with the Zillion, but Zillion, like you said, Skimmy, is a champion that has not been played. I would very, I'd be very surprised if Asta has this in his wheelhouse as well. So, that raises the question, okay. Never mind, Kanga take it away completely, and it's answered with a first pick Milio. Yeah, first pick Milio is very curious. Yes, we know that Milio is obviously a very strong champion, but it's really been far and few between, if ever, that we ever lock in a first pick support, at least for season 14. It's always been about these AD carries. Guarantee one of those and go from there. So the fact is for Kanga, well, if you're going to lock in that and try and say we want all the CC removal from a potential Wombo standpoint, the Udi can still be flexed. It absolutely crushed it in the jungle. And if you're not playing Aphilios, then we certainly will. Yeah, certainly looking like they are wanting to head towards that now. You'd imagine that the pairing with this Milio is a Lucian. However, could de definitely be one of the more DPS, you know, high range carries like a Caitlyn or something to kind of shut down this Aphilios in lane. But it will be interesting to see what they go towards. We know that the bot lane last game was certainly very handedly in the favor of Kanga after that initial trade. And that first blood went over in that Zyra Khan matchup. Wonder whether it will be a similar case of them jostling for that level one control and then kind of, you know, whoever wins that fight wins the lane and eventually goes on to win the game. Certainly do. Caitlyn, though, is going to be the pairing that they've gone for on this occasion. A bit of a different stance as to how you want to try and utilize Caitlyn in the lane, right? Usually speaking, you have it with a, uh, a very aggressive enchanter support like a Karma or a Lux, and you just got double range damage. You're hitting them from afar. Very annoying to try and deal with. This one, much more about the supportive angle, more attack range as if Caitlyn even needs more, um, and then the ability to try and get out of harm's way as a result. They're going to go for the Nar as well, an absolute specialty of Nectars, as uh, Kangol will get the chance to respond. Yeah, like you said, the range is going to be insane from this Caitlyn here. Going to be able to pester the Aphelios even when he does have that green gun available. So it'll be interesting to see what Kanga go for uh, to round out this first phase of picking. You can see that, you know, a support would go nicely, but they value this Azir so much. And that's what's going to be picked up by Rear Fury here. So this game, you know, sorry, game one, he didn't have the best showing, right? He did get picked on a little bit, particularly in side lanes, right? Just getting a little bit overconfident and looking for 1v1s where he really shouldn't have. But aside from that, he was fantastic in the late game. So, you know, going to comfort, defaulting to this champion who he has such a breadth of experience on in a situation where, you know, his setup isn't exactly what he's used to. Really smart play from Kanga. Certainly is, and I'm curious to see if they actually go down the same line of banning as they went before. Yes, Zoe's not been banned this game, but I wouldn't be surprised if they continue with uh, what was the call key into the Akali ban. Certainly would be a, uh, a heads up response to make sure that their squishies cannot get deleted and they can't match them as strongly as they would otherwise. But would they still consider the Zoe? Would they say it's more important, perhaps, than the matchup in isolation? Lulu and Pike, however, taken away by Mammoth for making sure that, yes, Kurek, we know you love these champions. You're not allowed the spicy one, nor are you allowed the metal one. 
But there we go, you can already see these pocket picks coming into effect. You can see that the fact that they have to ban something like a pike because they're scared of Kurak picking it opens the door for all of these meta supports to still be available for Kurak and he will you know, hopefully be looking towards this Nautilus here as a form of engage to really pair well alongside this Abelios and put pressure on the Mammoth bot lane. But it's actually going to be wow. a Senna instead. So they're fighting fire with fire. They're going double range into double range, looking to take control of this lane. But Skimmy, this is a very high risk strategy, right? Mammoth can punish this with Gudo coming down towards this bot lane. They weren't able to do it last game, but can they do it this game? Well, that's the age-old question, really, isn't it? It's a very greedy bot lane, not a matchup board pairing, I should say, that we see all too often, really. Definitely a case of being paired with somebody like a Tarn Kench as the default choice, but with the Affiliates here, it's basically saying you might have the range, but we'll have the CC to take you down. And that was the gamble in this uh, second drafting phase, right? Would it be the Akali or would it be the Zoe? Well, if you ban one, I'll take the other. And I think to really round it out, not too often you talk about a, a jungler that are going to try and complete the squad, but with this all in mind, could have really needs to find a champion that could absolutely crush it in the early game. Could be the Zin, it could be the Jarvan. And the Jarvan does seem quite appealing if you're looking to try and target that bot lane. Oh, it's the best champion in my opinion. You know, the mobility that you are going to have to deal with in the bot lane is none, right? Neither this Senna or Aphelios are going to be able to actually dash away from this Jarvan pre or post six, right? So he really is going to have a field day. Now, the question is, how does this pacing work, right? We saw that last game, the ideas were kind of similar, right? Gudo wanted to get down towards that bot lane, whereas Invictus on this Udia wanted to be the one who farms. If the same thing happens and they get to the bot lane at the same time, is Invictus simply stronger and he's able to win that 3v3? So it's going to be up to Gudo to take advantage of gaps in Invictus' pathing in windows where perhaps, you know, he has to skip a camp he's going to be able to get down towards that bot lane and force summoners. Because if you let this lane play out, if you let this send a scale, not only do you have a very strong mid who's already going to be powerful when it comes to the late game, you're going to have a ridiculously fed bot lane. Right, you are. I mean, absolutely. They want to make sure they can find those little opportunities and be uh, fairly creative with their pathing and their timing to try and throw uh, Invictus out of the loop. And I suppose really more than anything, uh, make sure that Relo and Kira keep guessing, keep sticking guessing themselves, perhaps actually have to play a little bit more passive in the lane and not utilize the fact that they have gone for this very risky strategy. Um, because otherwise, once again, you sort of get a little bit concerned that the late game's going to come around. Invictus is literally, and we saw it in the last game, become a 1v5 Titan and an Aatrox that split pushes all day long. So I'm wondering uh, very much the same kind of thought if it is going to be a very similar sort of uh, timeline in game two as to how these teams want to try and approach things or if we are going to have a very different outcome here because for Mammoth, they've, they've changed things up. They've got aggressive. We can clearly see that bot lane is the focus. It's whether or not they can actually, uh, yeah, utilize that. Look, the thing is, I think with Mammoth's comp this game is that their scaling is a little bit better, right? You obviously still don't want to go super late versus the comp that Tanga have drafted, but you are happier as the game goes on. I think this Akali in particular just has so much value as a champion versus these AD carries in the Azir of Kanga. It's always going to have so much value being able to find a shroud, being able to find a flank. And if you can pair that with a Jarvan who's jumping in to create chaos, there's a Meganar as well. Oftentimes these carries simply won't be able to just DPS the way that they would like. So there are definitely universes in which Mammoth are able to win these late game fights. To me, it's just more about keeping your bot lane in the game, right? Senna is a very strong champion when it's allowed to play just with no regard for the enemy jungle life. She's feeling like she can always go up, always fish for autos and Qs. Then this Senna is going to be incredibly powerful. So can Kanga empower that? And conversely, how can Mammoth shut that down? Well, it's a good question because both uh, the Azir and the Senna, as you say, will get more and more range from afar and it makes it even harder then for the likes of an Akali and a Jarvan to set up and flank or they will just get whittled down. Let's load ourselves then in to the Rift for the second time tonight as Mammoth are still searching for their first victory and Kanga are hoping to secure all three points tonight. Looking to secure three points, something that Kanga have yet to do but would very much value. As we load onto the Rift, pretty standard level ones across the board here. You can see the fan being employed by both teams here is Invictus maybe looking to link up with Kurak and get an early ward down. Udyr is a very strong level one champion with the ability to awaken whichever ability he picks, which is usually the Phoenix Dance. And you can see as well the Comet coming out from Wood on a very nice adaptation into Nah, acknowledging the fact that he's not going to actually be able to get too much value out of a Conqueror because those trades simply aren't going for long enough. Yeah, it was a uh, bit of tech 
long ago discovered that uh, certainly set the internet alight. Uh, but uh, people very much have uh, settled on the idea that this is the response into the NARC. I'll have to see if he can find himself a bit of success in terms of uh, navigating the range disadvantage very early on. But also that sustain with the NAR running fleet footwork. As for mid lane, tends to be a bit of a rough one for the Akali, having to cop all this damage as well from afar. But it hits that break point, right? And uh, suddenly the kill pressure switches around. Yeah, that's absolutely the case here, right? It is favorable for Azir in the early game purely just because he can kind of wail on Akali from a distance. But with the build that Dajong's gone for, right? Fleet footwork, resolve, door and shield, he is quite resilient, right? He is able to take a fair bit of poke without being forced out of lane. And then getting towards that level 6 point is where it really starts to unlock. And kind of around the map, that's the case for Mammoth, right? That Javan ultimate is going to be huge. So is that Nar ultimate for any potential, you know, skirmish that happens towards the top side of those grubs, of those Rift Herald. So that level 6 is going to be huge to keep an eye on for this team. So it does feel like one of those games where it's going to be built around the idea to hit level 6 as quickly as you can. And then what can you actually get accomplished with that? Will it be a team fight? Will it be a major objective or perhaps a chance to open the game up in a different idea we'll have to see as we'll keep ourselves uh, very much locked in on i want to say at least uh, top and mid for the meantime given the sort of mismatch between range and uh, and melee obviously bot lane is one we put a big focus on as well but much more so i would say once the junglers get involved because you're really looking to put a beacon on the good and say wherever you are we should be interested in yeah, and what's really interesting is Gudo's actually opted to path towards the top side here, right? You can see he's doing a full clear now. We'll just head towards the blue buff. So actually kind of acknowledging that his bot lane will be safe the first three waves, just saying that, okay, we know Invictus will full clear down. We know that's what Udi's going to do. We know that you can hopefully get a ward up to prevent any potential deaths and instead play towards this top side. Because like you said, he knows he's going to have priority in this top matchup. Nah has gone for the Doran shield as well. So definitely able to put quite a lot of poke into this Aatrox and a very calm early game to start well, a very calm game one. Too. You'd imagine that it would be the complete opposite given a sort of uh, hype that uh, came around that uh, game winning plate with the complete ace from everybody just exploding and having their own little pop off moment. Invictus however, he's going to poke his head into bot lane, see what happens. Never really showing too many signs of uh, an actual gank really happening, but just there to protect and anticipate if Gudo were to be near it. That's sort of what you'd expect. I think that's what everyone really expects, which is why it looks Whoa. so confusing to see him here in the top lane. Now, Nectar's jumped in, baiting at a stun, and it says, hang on a minute, there's a Javan as well. Wood on, can you win the 1v2? Apparently, yes, you can. That is not how you want to set up a gank there. You can see that Nectar's baiting, but he just ends up taking too much damage, right? That initial hop means he doesn't have it for his own escape. And ends up going down. Yeah, Wooden has to flash, but that's a massive turnaround. Oh, for the he's hit it! Of Kangaroos. Medajong! He's hit the Shuriken Strike amongst all those minions out of the Shroud and into the Cooker, and he just gets it done. And he's hit that power spike when you shouldn't have the kill pressure far too early. Yeah, just brutal there. Nice little trade back for the side of Mammoth. You can see that just getting a little too feisty amongst the minions, not respecting all the base damage that Akali has this early on in the game. As Dajong might be looking. He has to get away! Oh my god, what a clutch flash! Very, very close to greeting it as he tried to get one more wave in with Refury TPing back, but he's got away with it. He's paid the price of his flash, but he's greeted to get himself a first base shoe. Yeah, he wanted revenge there. You could see it in Refury's eyes, but unfortunately won't be able to get it. And now Dajan gets the TP in with a purchase advantage and with a health advantage too, so a very nice spot for the mid laner of Mammoth to be in, as you can see. Because of that mid lane situation and top lane having favorable resets, two grubs will be going into the hands of this Jarvan. Certainly will be. Vectors can take apart one, but uh, even with the vision revealing that uh, Gudo was there and lurking around, looking to try and put up a bit of a fight, we'll just concede and say it's not worth it. I'm not wasting time. I'd much rather fall clear and outpace you because we certainly know that an Udia will do that into pretty much most matchups. The pressure then is on Gudo to say, well, if you deny this, what can you get done afterwards? Level 6 now, starting to come into effect. Found, first of all, in the mid lane. And as we say, there's the Empress Divide, but look at the amount of mobility. And Akali has to say, you think you've got me? Think again. Yeah, Dajang forced to use his own ultimate here. We'll use the R2 there as well to create a little bit of space. But a nice little trade there from Ryu Fury, right? Trading ultimates at this stage in the game 
you'd have to feel decently happy about because it is so much of the kill threat that Akali has on you in that early game, right? Anytime you can trade those, you kind of buy yourself a minute and 30 seconds off safety, but the priority that Kanga's bot lane do have will enable them to get up and get this first dragon. Alt or not, flash or not, they don't seem to care. Okay. They're gonna keep going at it. He's flashed away the last second and then jumped across the wall, but dalsham has got nothing left. He was a very much dead as it, if not for that flash being available. And uh, for all the anticipation around this bot lane being the place to look at, I tell you what, mid lane's been delivering. Ryu Fury is playing with fire this game. A game of inches there. If he flashes even half a second later, he'll end up tanking that Akali cube. You can see he's definitely watching the Akali energy counting how long it is until she's able to use another Q and uses his flash at the right time. But you're absolutely right. If that flash hadn't been forced earlier, that would have just been another kill to Dajung. So already very explosive. And Akali is really the person that you do want to be getting fed if you're Mammoth this game. You really do. You want to make sure that the Akali can hit that sort of critical mass where one shots are a, a real possibility. Sure, you're not going to get the UD. You're probably going to look at him and laugh and say, I'm never even uh, locking eyes with you. But... Elsewhere for sure, a very, very squishy bot lane. Certainly you could poke your head into top lane as well and even consider the potential of an Aatrox, but yeah, Akali is an absolute terror. Good though, though. He's level six. He's in the bot lane. No level sixes for these uh, bot duos. But they've got to clear out that vision, otherwise it's just wasted time. Yeah, he loves his little bot plays, Gudo. He just stands in this bush forever, really. You can see that his top camps are respawning, but not for a while. So he does have a little bit of downtime in which he can do this. And because he's been here for so long, you'd assume Kanga might have felt at the bot lane base. Here he goes. Yeah, they might have thought he gone for the base, but Rila is realizing I'm going to split from my team. There's the Cataclysm. It's a bit of a game of chicken there. Who would pop their ability first? Ultimately, Gudo caves in. And it's a simple flash, really, for Rila afterwards. That's all it is, though, a Jarvan and gank at this stage. You gank once to get the flash and gank twice for the kill. And now, hopefully, that kill could coincide with a dragon that spawns in three minutes, right? You're able to flip the script a little bit and buy yourself some reprieve from the dragon stacking that this Invictus, that Invictus is really wanting to go for. But Gudo does have to commit his own flash, right? That is the cost, and he is down 20 CS. So, kind of similar to game one. Anytime he goes for a play, anytime he has any downtime whatsoever, it is going to be punished by Invictus, who is just steamrolling the CS as this Udyr. He certainly is. In many cases, actually doing better than some of the laners this game, right? And I feel like it's a it's a weird circumstance to be in when you can not necessarily AFK clear, but basically say, I can go unchecked and do all this and say that your champion cannot function in the same fashion of mine. So you are very much feast or famine based on the ganks working out. If they don't, well, I just get to continue winning, get to continue denying more of what you can achieve and your lane is going to have to try and make up for that mistake. That's exactly what we're seeing right now, right? With likes of Dajong and Asta forced to try and protect that side of the map. But he can just simply walk away and, uh, and make their laning phase even harder. Yeah, I think Dajong was tossing up whether he commits the perfect execution there to try to kill him. Eventually, Urz against it. But Asta has been found. He does have Flash. Yeah, not really willing to commit, though, was Reef here with the Empress Divide. This once again, warning shots. If you spend too much time around in this part of the map, it certainly will uh, put you in your place. That goes to Ghost there from Rila. Looking to try and make something happen, but Invictus didn't pull the trigger himself as well. So a bit of a miscommunication. You'd have to imagine there trying to run down this Caitlyn. There's a lot of hesitance here from either team, right? Neither one is wanting to fully commit to a play. As you can see on the top side of the map, Kudo is taking these Void Grubs and will be traded for Invictus securing the Krugs on the other side of the map. Again, Invictus trading objective for CS, objective for CS. Every time it feels like Reef Fury could be going down. He certainly could be. He gets one more shield, but walks into the face of Daoshung, who just flashes. And for the second time in a row, he's got his money. He's got his mark. But can he get out? One Shuriken Strike is there. And a Dawning Shadow from downtown too. It's just not enough. Yeah, it's close, and Ryu Fury does get Dajong under turret, but ultimately doesn't have the damage. There's too much mobility from Dajong, enabling him to get out and secure the kill as well. So, two kills in Mammoth, all in the hand of Dajong, all solo kills as well. Certainly is the perfect setup for them. A much better early game for Mammoth as well, but you've got to take into consideration how this bot lane is looking. It looks still like uh, both Rila and Kurak are able to step up fairly aggressive here. And uh, despite the range of the varnish that Caitlyn may possess, he's able to actually command the CS lead. 
Yeah, as we take another look at the mid lane play here, you can see that the Shroud is just too strong for Ryu Fury to deal with. He does get the shove, but only one tick of the turret actually lands onto Daljong from that initial scoop, right? It's the perfect execution that does come out to enable Daljong to get out of range. So, nice little shove, but unfortunately, against the champion with so much mobility, it's not going to be enough. And I'll tell you what, once uh, Darjan gets an opportunity to try and rotate elsewhere on the map, I'll be very, very wide right now. He has that TP, and he certainly has the ability to continue to push in these waves first. So, as to be expected, wave gets shoved, vision's been deployed, top lane looking like an easy highway to success. Yeah, that was very close there for Nectar. He was almost a second off tanking at Q3. It's a bit of skirmishing, but nothing too committal. Darjong is in the area, though, and stun lands. It does uh, actually come into effect right now as he jumps into a shroud. Once again, has no flash. Has the ultimate. Does he need to burn it? No, he does not. A single three-point strike to the dome gets it done. And the baiting this time works in favor of Nectar. Now, down to the bot lane we look as another gank. Well, I say a gank. Uh, another case of Invictus being in the area really takes place. And it really just gives them the insurance to say, you can push these towers, you can get all these tower plates. Yeah, all these plates and another dragon as well, Skimmy. You can see Invictus taking the opportunity when he knows the good is on the top side of the map to get another one of those. As Ryu Fury found again. No oh, that oh. was nice. That one was very well played. Otherwise, it would have been the trifecta of uh, kills in the mid lane taking place. Now, has Dongsheng run himself into a bit of a, a bit of a situation? Because how do you outrun a new deer unless you deny yourself now? And can you? Because you've just killed top lane. He's respawned, and he's come to get his shut down. Yeah, revenge is sweet. Says Wudon as he picks up that kill there. You can see a very weird timer for Aatrox to be top to be bot really. But after that kill top lane and losing his turret, he has nowhere else to be. And because of that as well, he's able to commit down towards his dragon. Darjong did use TP and won't be respawned for another 10 seconds. So it just looks like a second dragon in the hands of Kanga. Yeah, a bit too easy there for Kanga there, being bailed out of a bit of a bit of a poor situation. No doubt about it. I'm sure Darjong would have loved to have been involved in that one, given that he's just picked up the rocket belt. He's incredibly strong, as demonstrated there by the overall gold. But I think Woodon certainly got a major, major boost after that shutdown too. Yeah, absolutely. Working his way towards that Profane Hydra now. It's such a strong spike when you manage to pick that up and then grab the Serrated Dirk too. You are so powerful, especially compared to these Squishies who are really just completing their one items. You are going to be melting through those health bars. And really, with the Herald spawning in three seconds, it will be interesting to see what these teams are prioritizing, whether they want to flip any supports up towards the top side of the map, which looks like what Mammoth are intending to do now and have this Darjong, have Darjong on Akali against these two squishies. Not where you want to be if you're the Kangaroo carry. Well, certainly not. Not going to get anywhere near as uh, much uptime to try and harass this uh, Akali into the Shroud and out of it into very much some very uh, strong kill pressure there. But it is uh, a peculiar circumstance to find yourself in as a Caitlyn to not be the one ahead. You certainly need a fair few items to come online. The mid game, usually that real big weakness for a Caitlyn where other champions can certainly come into effect. And still searching for that very first completed item as Reela's already got the Storm Razor done. Yeah, Reela's sitting on the Storm Razor. Basically everyone on Kanga with a completed item now obviously decides Kurak as Mammoth will be the ones to start up this Herald. Looking at their positioning, it looks like Kanga doesn't really want a contest. Instead, they're favoring, you know, setting up vision on this bot side of the map, getting those control wards out and buying Rear Fury some safety because right now, He's really just forced to catch waves under his turret. He's not able to contest this Akali in the long lane. He will just get ran down and killed unless there's an Udi there. That is the case. And it's really a game of uh, cat and mouse as to will you take the bait because we've seen that certainly work for and against in the top lane for Nectar. But Dajun showing a lot more restraint perhaps after just falling victim to that death before. He's biding his time, isn't taking any chances, and just will simply reset back to base, but then decide to cancel it with Invictus being ever so patient, waiting for the Akali to show again. Yeah, he's hovering. I think he can smell the fact that there are other Kanga members in the area, or else Ryu 3 wouldn't be so confident in shoving this wave. Nice little bit of patience. You know, he could have potentially tried to style there, but instead opts for the safe play. Instead opts to not go into the unknown. You, know, you never know how many members of Kanga are actually sitting there off vision could be caught off and give over a kill into the hands of this Azir. So, a nice play from Darjong there, respecting the enemy team. 
much needed respect as this game is still very much on a knife's edge. Five Void Grubs for the side of Mammoth as opposed to two Dragons picked up here by Kanga. But the gold difference, really, only 500 in it. But I tell you what, whenever Mammoth get a chance to hit these towers, Void Mites are being spawned, pressure is being applied. And uh, the map just becomes a little bit bigger, a little bit easier then for the likes of not only a Jarvan, but an Akali and an Arta then possess flanks. And that's huge, right? It is all about flanking when you are on this Akali. You need to have the routes and the windows to be able to actually do that. Right now, with all turrets still remaining for Kanga, besides that one in the top lane, it feels pretty hard as an Akali, right? You can see that Kanga have done quite a good job of actually setting up their vision. They've done quite a good job of actually making sure that they're clearing wards for any TPs that could come through as well. So as we head towards this next dragon in a minute and a half, it will be interesting to see what Darjong and Mammoth as a whole do to try to secure this Akali at beneficial position. Especially looking around the map to see if anybody decides to step up is Darjong. As he continues to sit pretty in the bot lane here. Keen to take on anybody in a 1v1. I will say though, credit where credit is due for Goodo, in terms of being down so much CS, he's brought it back to dead even into uh, the matchup of the Udia, who's, for the most part, spent a little bit of time hovering rather than farming. I'm looking to see if anybody were to try and take the gamble and then, then be dead, almost pounce in a 1v2 circumstance. Doesn't really turn the conversation in terms of scaling, but certainly makes Goodo feel a little bit stronger about their chances to try and remain relevant here. Yeah, absolutely does. This Jarvan will always be feeling pretty good with that Cataclysm available, but there are just so many summoners available, Skimmy, right now. Looking down, both teams have every single summoner available to them heading into this dragon fight. And this really is an important dragon fight for both teams, right? For Mammoth, it's an opportunity to delay this game further, to buy themselves a little bit more time for a to have that beneficial fight where Akali can find the carries. And for Kanga, it's a potential sole point, right? You're accelerating this game with this comp that already scales incredibly well. If you find this dragon, you put yourselves in a very commanding position to close this game out. But in saying that, Max, it is Kanga the ones that show no real interest of wanting to group up for this one. It's good enough to summon the Herald on mid to make sure that they will finally break this one open, summon an army of Voidlings to take it down with them, and guarantee that mid lane control will in fact be theirs for good. Now, Wooden for the most part has just been sitting pretty in top lane, AFK waiting to try and TP in if called upon, and the Nazir definitely doing the same as well. They're staying spread out and allowing Mammoth to do as they please, both in mid as well as controlling the pace of getting entry into the Dragon. Yeah, this feels like an interesting trade from Kanga here. I'm not sure why they feel like they can't fight. Their items is feeling pretty good. They've got decent breakpoints on every single carry, so I do wonder whether the communication is just focused on gold, right? They want to trade up in gold. They want to get those turrets while Mammoth are getting this Dragon. And Obviously for them, this dragon isn't really anywhere near as consequential as it would be if Kanga themselves are the ones who took it, but still would on. Opting into this PvE playstyle, picks up the Edge of Knights, now two item Aatrox. You're feeling pretty good at this stage in the game. They will not be feeling too good right now as Reef here. I say an absolute lie. He shuffles one way, good hope goes the other, and it's just a bit of a thumbs up, how do you do, thanks for your tower. Yeah, Reef has been really good at navigating these situations this game, right? Had some pretty clutch shuffles. He had the earlier one to dodge the Akali ult, and now this one to get out of dodge as well. But Kanga as a whole are doing a better job of moving members to him, right? <laughs> Making sure that he's not as Asta is almost caught there. Very dangerous situation. But you can see that Kanga are more willing to move members around as a whole now. It's no longer this is here by himself trying to catch a wave and trying to push a turret. He now has the whole team to back him up. So nice movement, particularly of Wudon, who is really your strongest member at this stage, to get even further ahead. And it's been so interesting for me, the sort of the, the approach that Kanga have taken to this entire series, that we should really focus on macro and side lanes, whether or not they've identified uh, a very conscious decision that Mammoth haven't been the strongest when it's come to attending to these lanes, that they are very much akin to grouping up as five and all inning on anything they see within their vision line, and that they can just win the game by ignoring and pushing lanes. Because that has been a successful strategy. Certainly at times it's been a bit of a risk and a gamble, but more often than not it has paid out and uh, worked out in their favor. As we see two top laners chuck out a few spells, Nectar burning the ultimate. Nothing really coming of it as they're very much landlocked to pick up that CS. As for the rest of the team, though, very much interested in looking at this red buff and the potential steal away as Invictus steps up. Or oh, the blast the cone. Massive blast cone, which forces Asta to flash the safety. But Wooden says, I'll take that one. Gets knocked back by the ability. Moonlight Vigil completely airballing, but the Dawning Shadow comes across as well. There's some shield. There's some damage as Darshan goes in and nearly lights out onto the Aatrox. 
Gudo limping away at the bottom of your screen. Darjong, he's already hit that perfect execution, but can he now perfectly disengage as Rila flashes on his head with the chakrams and gets him done with old mate Gudo? Baron on his head. There is the flash, or rather there's the cataclysm, and it's actually Gudo flashing away because he doesn't have the damage. It's scrappy, it's messy, it's chaotic, but it's still looking like a Kanga W. Yeah, at the end of the day, it will be a Kanga W as they're chasing onto Nectar here. He does have a lot of mobility as this Mega Minina and looks like he'll be able to get out. But Skinny, that all started as a fight over a red buff and ends up with four members going down on the side of Mammoth. It was an initial nice take on the Blast Cone, but after that, it kind of just evolved into mini skirmish after mini skirmish and Kanga across the board just outplayed them. Not a single flash left up and available. And for the fight that you were expecting it to take place around, being the dragon, it wasn't. It's here yeah, instead. No. Just the red buff. And you can see the initial blast code is really nice. Puts Asta really out of position into Woodon's waiting arms. But it's the Ultra Mega Inferno Kick that is the one, the difference maker here, right? It separates Woodon, makes him not able to actually get that reset on the World Ender. And he gets baited. He sees those low HP bars, wants to get that reset on his ult timer but simply won't find it. And then after that, you can see Rhea Fury has a very nice position onto the rest of the members of Mammoth who are incredibly low and realer. Full HP, red, white, don't fight. Clearly Guru didn't get the Membo because he jumps in and it leaves Asta all alone. In isolation, you're thinking that's a great play. You've taken down and punished the Flashless of Felios. It doesn't have enough damage. Yes, you're a Jarvan. Yes, you're strong, but it's that initial punch of your passive in the Sun to the Sky. But after that, you're really left out of juice, and uh, ultimately Kengo thinking, okay, pretty dicey fight. We take that. We're happy about the fact that we can deny Dajun from really breaking up in that game, because that certainly could have been the situation where the Akali really steals the spotlight. Yeah, it absolutely could have been, but I think Kanga did a nice job of kind of draw the battle lines during the middle of that fight, right? Still enabling their carries to hit. Rear Fury was trapped in a very precarious spot between what looked like four Caitlyn traps. Anywhere he stepped, he would have been headshot, but uses a very nice flash to kind of separate himself, create distance, uh, while still be able to get hit um, on towards Gudo. So a nice little play there from Kanga, who now they're 1k ahead, but it's the control that matters. It's this control around Baron, and right now it's pretty even. Actually is pretty even. That has really been the uh, the main statement of this entire second game. Very different to how it played out in game one, right? And despite it having its topsy-turvy uh, sort of state in game one, you always felt like Kanga had an ability from the very get-go to try and close this one out. In this one, though, I'm still left guessing who takes this one out because it just feels like there's a Baron Dance or a Dragon Dance waiting to bait out that big 5k divide. I mean, speaking of a Dragon Dance, there is another Chemtech Drag spawning in one minute, and this time, it looks like Mammoth are wanting to contest, and Kanga are very happy to meet them there as well. Here goes Gudo, no flash on Rila. No flash, that means it's just a little bit too easy there for Mammoth to punish it. This is what their comp is built to do, run you down, break you down, and have no real way of escaping. Darjong underneath the turret, he's trying to kill Anud yet. He didn't get that moment from game one. What are you doing? You've got the shutdown. You have, and you've drawn their attention. And I guess in the overall grand scheme of things here, Max, at least your team were there to pick up the Drake. I mean, that's actually beautiful from Darjang, right? It looks terrible if he doesn't get the kill onto Invictus, but luckily he manages to find that. Landing a Shuriken flip somehow through all of that chaos, but ultimately that's a trade you're very happy with as Mammoth, right? Like you said, they're able to pick up the Dragon in the time that Darjong is off making that play, and they get the kill onto Rila too. That's big, and that shows how hard it is to play as this Abelios into a Jarvan. You can see, the second they find him, they're going to pull that trigger. You know that, but unfortunately, he shows on Vision here, and Kudo, no hesitation whatsoever, jumps on him, takes him down. It certainly does, and Darjong just sees, well, this is the first target in sight. I'll just pursue this one at all costs. Ultimately, you would have loved to see them go for the squishier members, but you can't really doubt them for saying, I'm incredibly strong. I'm pretty sure I can even kill a tank Udi at this point. Yeah, he can. I think Invictus got a little bit overconfident there as well, running back in to, you know, try to get that extra hit on towards Darjong. I think if he just runs away, he will be fine. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is a very even game. It is only 300 gold separating the team. Dragon's tied. Kills are tied. Turret's one in the favor of Mammoth. But overall, this is all going to come down to execution. How are these teams playing around Baron and Mammoth? 
right now. You can see that the vision they have around the Baron is very intense. They've got control wards in the pit. They've got control wards in the tri brush. There's really no way for Kanga to get in there without Mammoth knowing. It certainly is very, very difficult for them to try and make that one happen. As we quickly check in with the overall goal, top three would be um, slightly expected. I think the, the, the biggest one and the quietest achiever would be Nectar and the Snar to find himself with the second most amount, nearly the most amount of gold in this game. He's uh, got a bounty in his head and he's been farming up an absolute treat. I will say though about the itemization, one thing that's caught me off a little bit guard here is uh, the rushing of LDR's second for Duck, right? Usually seeing a, a rapid fire cannon coming out to try and tide you over into that mid game, but once that uh, armor shred, well, I don't really see too much armor being uh, purchased. Yeah, I think the thing that he's thinking is this Udia never dies if I go RFC, right? I think he's just too low damage. Yes, RFC is really nice to have against the Squishies, which enables you to kind of land those long-range headshots. But range isn't really a problem this game, right? He already has that Milio W to empower. He's already incredible range. So instead, he just needs a bit more power, a bit more punch to be able to get through the health bar of this Udia, who is really going to be hard to take down. You saw how long it took Dajong basically a full combo, four rotations of Qs and two rotations of Es to actually kill him. So in a team fight, that'll be even harder with all his members to support him. So Caitlyn, instead opting to try to just brute force through this area. Let's see then if that is the right call. Because it's 27 minutes into this game right now, the Baron continues to taunt and tease both sides as to who decides to entertain the idea of setting up and starting up that objective. Vision line once again being drawn by other side as to, okay, what's being cleared? What do we want to know? And who do we want to try and pick apart as a result? As uh, lanes are being uh, foregoed for the moment, it's all about taking these jungle camps, all about eking out any kind of advantage through some gold lead that you can find. As Good Oaks takes battle with his enemy jungler, but look at the headshot damage onto Kurek, instantly getting dropped down. It's 70 burns to The flash has just come back up, but they're instantly burnt again. Dajong underneath the tower trying to take down Refuel, but he's losing! He's losing in the shroud, and Refuel absolutely wipes him with the Leandries. And if Dajong's not there, I just don't know if Mammoth have enough fight. Yeah, it's a complete outplay from Rio Fury in the 1v1. Darjon just assumes that he can win it. Gets incredibly overconfident. Rio Fury has a nice dash to bring Darjon all the way back into his heart. But here goes Nectar. Nectar jumping in, trying to shove them up against that broken tier 1 tower. Doesn't find it as clean as you would have hoped for. But still, Reela is gone for right. They turn now onto Invictus. The tank, Udia, finally majors full. Kill secured by Gudo. No smite. And maybe, despite everything, Mammoth can win and now finally go towards Baron. Respect the Neck. Nectar takes advantage of that previous fight. Reela just gets overconfident. He has no flash. He thinks because Cataclysm's down, there's no way for him to actually get killed. But there is, and it's Nectar using the double hop into a flash ultimate that is taking him down. And now, eyes are on the Baron. It's half HP, but Rio Fury and Rudon are here. Double TP in from double help liners as they look to try and contest this one. It's going to be a 3v4, but it's a smite advantage for Goodo as they go for this one. Claimed by them. Baron buff up. Meganar turning him into the wall. A two man stun! It's just a little bit too easy. Yes, Kanga finds two in the process of things. And of course, Woodon is incredibly strong. But can he 1v3? Oh, what well, he's taking down two now. And he's looking to try and find a few more. Rooted in place by the trap. Flashing out of that one, but destroyed by the ultimate. Wudon will get taken down. Looked like he was going to have his The Shy moment, but he will be silenced. As we take a look back at what started it all, really, you can see Nectar hovering just on the cusp of crocking Mega. Throws that boomerang and gets this double jump into throwing Rilla against the wall, forcing him to stand on that trap and taking the very strong AD carry down. And the jungler as well, right? Invictus falling is really the key here because it enables Mammoth to go towards Baron uncontested. Yes, there are these healthy tank carries really alive for the side of Kanga, but there's no smite. And that's the important thing, right? Guru is able to pick it up without worry of that being smite stolen, but it's still a very close fight, Skimmy. I mean, this entire series has just been too close to the core. I mean, if you're watching this one as a fan of either side, you must be sitting on the edge of your seat thinking, please, it can't go this way. This Baron, despite having a spite, still felt ever so risky. But Nectar, absolutely, I mean, he, he put his life on the line there. I think he's thought he's done just enough with a leap away. Oh, yeah, he absolutely did, right? That double start into the wall is huge. That's really what secures in the fight here. And Duck just does so much damage, right? This LDR has really been proving valuable. 
He's able to kind of melt through this Aatrox who just doesn't have any armor whatsoever to help him against this Caitlyn. And now you're playing against the Caitlyn Milio with Baron. The range on this, Caitlyn's able to basically outrange the turrets at this stage. Now with the rapid fire cannon, she absolutely can. So it becomes very hard. How do you actually start fights now, right? What are the tools that you have to actually be able to pull this one off? Because if you let this go on, this Kalen is just going to keep breaking down your base. But it does really feel like at this point, yes, what Dajun ran the early game, and it certainly does in the team fight. Uh, Duck with Baron as well can certainly just dictate the entire late game condition, right? You've got the Void Mites, you've got the Baron buff, you've got the Sieging Potential, and you've got the range. Nodi from Kanga can step up, and you know he can flank anywhere near as effectively as what we see Mammoth do. Yeah, absolutely not. As we see that the items are coming online for Kanga. They've picked up three items now on this Ephalia. Still quite far behind Duck on this Caitlyn. The whole BF sword is the difference at the moment. But Ryu Fury is really the one to keep your eyes on, right? Similar to game one, he had a very quiet early game, but now he's certainly gearing up to be able to take over these late game fights. If we're at a stage where an Azir is able to beat a Akali in a straight 1v1 inside of a team fight, that's a really dangerous situation to be in because then what is the value of this Akali? And not even to mention, how fed and how strong this Lethality Aatrox is, right? He, in his own right, can absolutely wreak havoc on a backline. So it really is a battle of the flank. It's a battle of keeping those key carries alive long enough for them to DPS and win you the team fight. Certainly, if given an opportunity to do so, they can just win the fight outright for their team. They've got the tools, they've got the items. They've just got to find the moment to strike and really hope that the opposition grants them that passage into saying, I have no flash. Try and take me down. Speaking of, Rila and Kurek are about to get theirs back out of available. Same for Refury too. And we spoke about how important it was for them in the past and how vulnerable they are when they're unable to escape the clutches of a Jarvan and a Nart. Well, they've got another two minutes now to rest on the laurels and really get as strong as they can be before that next dragon for the sole point or their next Baron. Yeah, both time is very close in proximity. You can see only 15 seconds the difference between the spawning of those two objectives, which does beg the question, what will Kanga do? As seems like chasing Nectar is their option now, but that mini now is just too fast. Yeah, I mean, Kurak, or rather Reelers, pop the Ghost there with the Graviton Cannon available, thinking maybe we can try and pick this one apart, 1v2, but it just does not matter. I feel like your priority number one has to be, wherever this Caitlyn is, shut it down. Duck gets an opportunity to hit that tower for a second, and it's gone. That's absolutely right. You leave this Caitlyn Milio unchecked, and they will just ruin the entire game here. Duck now in a very strong position, as he's kind of the king that they want to move around the map, keep him safe, but keep him firing. That's how you're going to win this game. Nectar, on the other hand, getting very aggressive here on towards Wudon. He has so much mobility. You can see how fast he is when he procs that Hyper that even an Aatrox is not able to lock him down. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's got the damage, he's got the mobility, but he doesn't have the lifesteal that uh, Wudon certainly has in response. So it's all about, can he navigate that one nicely and keep ultimate uptime on the Snar, or will he get spaced out? Because he's max level now. 18 is there. It's another game that's going the distance. And last game, bear in mind, was closed out at 33 minutes. This one, however, is going a little bit longer. And I tell you what, based on what we're sort of predicting, it's all going to come to a head either for the soul point or for this next Baron. Yeah, looking like Dragon will be the point of call for both of these teams here as Wudon has TP'd in. We're going to be looking for a flank here. It'll be interesting to see how he matches up against Dajong, who is also contesting this same flanking angle. You can see Udia very happy to tank the Caitlyn ultimate as he was before. Crucially, the Scuttle Crab does go in favor of Mammoth, so that'll be a nice little pickup for them. But look at the flanking route Dajong's gone on. It's quite long, but he will get spotted by minions on his way here. Standing well as a trap. He's really looking to try and draw the lines and say, you're going to be completely stuck in this position. Nectar's freely pushing mid lane right now, threatening the idea of taking an inhibitor, and Dajong also attending to that side lane down at south. Kanga down to say, well, we have to push past these traps and we've got to start this dragon. Out comes the TP, but look at the position for both Kurak and Rila. In jumps Guru, hits that massive cataclysm onto one right now. Flashing out, drops the redemption, and that's Rila just dead. Duck's taking him. The dragon held in suspension. Darjan running away back towards the dragon itself. He takes that wooden minute respawn time as Rifri flashing away. He's put the wall up with that Empress Divide. But the dragon being denied with Darjan still Refury? living. 
they're thinking, is this fight won? I don't know if it is, because these three members still surviving from Kanga are so strong. They've got the range, they've got that tankiness, and it's about, can you shut this Udia down? He is a late game Terran who might simply max 1v3. Sven has taken down Nemilio, and Invictus is saying, if you TP in, you're an absolute madman, knocked up against the wall, boulder to the head, and Re Fury's finally dead. Darjung, however, though, might also be in a similar predicament and eventually falls down too. Yeah, I don't know if it's over yet, Skimmy. I think Invictus wants to find Nectar here and find him he will with the Senator chase him down. So across the board, a fight of both sides coming out on top at some points, right? You can see Mammoth start the fight well. They find multiple engage angles. And that really enables Darjong to buy a lot of time on the flank, right? You can see he's dragging three members away, gets the shroud, flashes out, manages to escape. But after that, the DPS still remains for Kanga. Yes, you kill Rila, but you've forgotten about this center. This center now is sitting in a very strong position with the amount of souls that she's collected. 152 souls for Kurak now on this center. And those kills, that late TP from Darjong, means it's the Baron for Kanga. That it certainly is. It's worth mentioning, I'm not sure if you caught, uh, caught it in that fight, but Kurek did the most damage in this team fight. Did 10,000 more than anybody as the support center. But as you say, 150 stacks, that's what a center can do. Yeah, it absolutely can. But you can see the fight starts well for Mammoth, right? They managed to chain CC really. He doesn't even have time to flash out of the Cataclysm because Nectar's able to get in there. And look at the bottom of the fight, right? Sarjan buys so much time, keeps Rear Fury and Kurak separated from the rest of the fight. But now, this is really the turning point because there's no engage tools left to get onto Kurak. And Rear Fury as well on this Azir, it's almost like deja vu from last game with his ability to run down the enemies after they've secured an objective. Like you said, Skimmy, keep your eyes on Kurak here because everyone's so focused with killing the Udia that they forget about the setup. And this was uh, a concern that we rose very early um, on in this game, right? Oh, I hold that for a second because here we go again! It's a late game cataclysm, three members in place! They've got no flash, they've got no chance. Easy as that as they take down three in a heartbeat. They're not going to be settled as they want another one. Dalsian wants to drop aggro with a stopwatch, but that stopwatch will only delay the inevitable. It's wood on against the world. And for all the hype and celebration of Kanga, have they just all thrown it away? There's a wave, Skimmy. Wooden has to cut this before Mammoth get to it if he wants to have a chance in this game. They're trying to bring the mid wave in. The death time is at 30 seconds on Kurak. They've got Jarvan. They've got a Caitlyn as well, Skimmy. Wooden's going to have to pull up a miracle if he wants to save this game. He has to pull up a miracle! Oh, he's found one! Is the montage music playing? Or am I getting overexcited? There is the ace. It started, it came to an end as quickly as it began with the Void Mites with nobody in base defense. It's going to be a draw. Mammoth have finally won their very first game and they'll at least pick up a point tonight. Neither team can secure the 2-0. It hurts so much for Kanga. The game was looking so good after that fight, but just like game one, all it takes is one fight and the game ends. 1-1, Kanga and Mammoth. Unbelievable uh, sort of way to start off your week here in the LCO. Monday is delivering. If you thought this series was hype and finishing in a draw, I tell you what, after this, we have an even better series at the top of the table. We're going to jump to a quick break, and when we return, we'll give a chance to break down everything we saw in the series. <laughs>